All right, I'm Jason Whitlock. That's Marcellus Wiley. That dude. Yes, sir. All right, welcome to Speak for Yourself, the most fearless show in sports. Coming up, we'll tell you if the Chiefs are mishandling the Tyreek Hill situation. And one hour from now, we'll have some thoughts on Kawhi Leonard, who's getting introduced today right here in L.A. All right, but we start today with the NFL. People say a lot of things about Carolina Panthers quarterback Cam Newton. He needs to stop running so much. He must improve his footwork and throwing mechanics. He's a sore loser. He's an awkward public speaker. Hmm. He needs to improve as a leader. There's truth in the critiques of Cam Newton. But I start every football season with the belief that Cam is capable of duplicating his 2015 MVP season. I pretty much start every year believing he will return to MVP form. Why? Because Cam Newton has a genuine competitive fire on the same level as Drew Brees and Tom Brady. The game is important to Cam. Being great is important to Cam. The NFL Network ranked Cam as the 87th best player headed into this season. Mm. That's 62 spots lower from where he ranked a year ago. The ranking is not unfair based on Cam's performance last year with a shoulder in need of repair much of the season. But the ranking is highly inaccurate in terms of what Cam is capable of delivering. Trust me, Cam is not happy at number 87. His competitive fire, his desire to be great, will propel him to improve in all areas this season. Footwork, mechanics, leadership, understanding of the game. In terms of fashion sense, Cam is a lost cause. He can't be fixed or improved. He's <laughs> colorblind, cross-eyed, and tasteless. In terms of football, the 30-year-old quarterback is just walking into his prime years. I believe Cam's best playing days are still all in front of him and not behind. Cam's shortcomings can and will be improved. There's no fixing a non-competitor. It's a mistake to write off anyone with talent who has a genuine competitive spirit. The Amazon Prime documentary football series, All or Nothing, captured footage last year of Cam and Panthers head coach Ron Rivera discussing the possibility of the Panthers acquiring safety Eric Reed the national anthem kneeler. Cam expressed concern about the addition of Reed to the roster, telling Rivera, my thing is this, and I'll let you talk. We don't want no outside distractions. Cam may take some heat for expressing this kind of raw honesty, but I love it. It shows you how important winning is to Cam. He knows exactly how controversial it is for any NFL player to show discomfort with the national anthem annex that Colin Kaepernick popularized but he raised the concern with Rivera as a team leader and as someone focused on winning. I believe Cam's perspective is reflective of the overwhelming majority of NFL players, regardless of their color. On the football field, they want to play football and compete. Off the field, they want to help and be assets in their community. Once again, I'm starting this season betting on Cam being in the MVP race. His competitive nature is causing him to mature as a player and a leader. All right, joining the desk now are Fox NFL mm. analyst Mark Slareth and LeVar Arrington. Marcellus, I'll start with you. I think Cam will be in the MVP hunt this season. No, no, not at all. Um, respect to Cam Newton, who may be my favorite football player, certainly uh, if you don't want to talk about the MVP and Patrick Mahomes, who is quickly coming for that title. Um, this is why he won't win the MVP or be even in the conversation, truthfully. Uh, you talk about a guy who's coming off of two shoulder surgeries in the last couple of years. Uh, you talk about a guy who um, is now getting to the system and we saw last year couldn't throw the Hail Marys at the end of the year. Okay, he could redeem himself. Great. He could have a great year. Andrew Luck had a great year. Was the comeback player of the year and was not in the MVP conversation. I think Cam Newton will find himself somewhere in that world of, oh, if you want to Consider him for comeback player of the year? Maybe, but he's probably overqualified for that. Plus, Jimmy G's coming back. And you talk about what the MVP is going to look like in terms of numbers? That's a 5,050 award now. You got to tell me, is Cam Newton going to come back and throw 50-ish? Don't have to do it. 5,000-ish yards? So where is it going to come from? That's why I think Patrick Mahomes and others are going to stretch the MVP conversation. And last year was a two-man race. And it really was only a one-man race. Drew and... Patrick. Yeah, Drew Brees, Patrick Mahomes, but Drew Brees was thrown in there a lot yep. for the nostalgia and everything. So that race is going to go a little too far in terms of the numbers that Cam Newton can put up. 
But he's going to ball out, and he's going to be Cam, and he's going to help that team, obviously. Uh, let me tell you why you're, why you're correct about a lot of things you said about Cam and why you're incorrect when it comes to the MVP race, okay? Cam has an unfair comparison that he has to live up to, and that's to Cam. 2015 Cam. Mm -hmm. He can do that again. There's no way he'll do that again because of the maturity, because of the growing up, because he realizes that his body will not survive the way he played in 2015. You have to think about this. Cam Newton in 2015 completed 59 point whatever percent of his passes. Last year, under Norv Turner, he completed 67.9% of his passes. It was one of the, it was for him the highest, the yeah. highest comp uh, completion percentage he's ever had. Now he's gone through this maturation process. He has grown up. He understands that he's going to have to win games in the NFL from the pocket. And he also understands at going on 30 now, he's he can no longer do the things he's done to his body and be successful in this league. So when we can when we look at Cam for MVP, we'll always compare Cam to the dynamic mm. guy who can take off and run and, and score touchdowns and jump off. He's just not going to put himself in that situation. Like I had this conversation with him and it was fascinating to me. And there was he had a, a presence about him. He had a humility about him and, and it shocked me. I really, as, as a, a NFL analyst and a guy who does games, it shocked me a little bit. And so we're having the conversation. I said, what, what's different about you? And he said, oh, man, I had an experience with my daughter. Mm. I said, what, what, what happened? He goes, she was throwing a temper tantrum at a, at a we're in, in the mall or whatever, and she's throwing a temper tantrum. And I'm like, how is it you're acting like this? You're acting like a spoiled brat, blah, blah, blah. And she go, and he said, my mother looked at me and said, she just acts exactly like you. Mm -hmm. And he goes, and it's, I mean, it was a punch to the gut. And I said to myself, or he said to, he goes, I said to myself, this is Cam going, man, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta fix that. I gotta clean things up. He's a, like, to me, he's, he has accepted that responsibility. He's a different guy and he understands he can't win long-term that way, and we can't get that vision hmm. of him being Superman out of our minds. That's why he's not an MVP candidate. That's a hard one, because I live that. The LeVar Leap needed to take place every single play for me to be a successful football player, and that, that can hurt and right. hurt your, your ability to be seen as, as a real player. You know, I, it's been personalized as to why or why not he won't become the MVP of this league. I look more so from a team standpoint. I love football because it's a total team sport. Your success is based upon how you play as a team. We can look at the stats. We can throw a lot of different things out there that may justify one reason or another why the man may be the MVP in the running or not. You mentioned a guy by the name of Drew Brees. Drew Brees has brought that entire team with him. And they're able to, with different guys, different years, are able to maintain a high level of accomplishment. I see that same type of leadership out of Cam Newton. The thing he has working in his favor is Drew Brees, Ryan, are, are in the same division, in that, that NFC South. If he wins out his division, if he shows a dominant ability to play within his division, he's certainly in the discussion of being the MVP. So I don't even look at it from the standpoint of, okay, well, if Mahomes comes with a ton of, of passing yards, he may very well get the MVP award based upon, again, where the team ends up. Because I don't see a guy getting massive numbers getting an MVP award over somebody who may not have the same numbers, but they're having success as a team, especially at the quarterback's position. So I look, at, I look at Cam being in position to say, okay, I'm going to be competitive. I'm going to lead my team. Somebody over here may run for more yards. McCaffrey may run for more yards because of the elements I provide as a running quarterback, the elements I provide in being able to throw the ball downfield, the things that we create matchup-wise against the defenses. It's going, to, it's going to be a Styles points type of deal for Cam Newton, and he's going to have to first start by dominating and winning his division, and then he's in the conversation. And, and Marcel, mm. obviously I love Patrick Mahomes. Man. But I think what's going to happen with the numbers is kind of like what's happened with James Harden, what's happened with Russell Westbrook. It's like, okay, triple-double, that's nice. Oh, yeah. 50 TDs, that's nice. Blah, blah, blah. And then it's going to be looking at all the intangibles – 
people will start looking for other narratives, other stories. And I think Cam will have a great story to tell because at, watching him last year where he struggled with the shoulder and things like that to me were in the second half, fourth quarter of the game. They were in a lot of tight games that gave him a chance to have a fourth quarter comeback. And that's why I think the maturity, the repaired shoulders, second year with North Turner, second year with Christian McCaffrey as a feature guy, I think we're going to see Cam in the fourth quarter of games mm. do some incredible things that keep him mm -hmm. in the, oh, another fourth quarter comeback from Cam Newton. I don't think he has to match. I don't even think he if, – if, if Mahomes throws 50 and Cam throws 38 and they're 12 and 4 – and Cam's led some fourth quarter comebacks, and Cam has six rushing TDs. I think Cam's got a hell of a story for MVP because I just remember the first six games of last year, and I was like, oh my first God. First eight, they were six and two. Yeah, yeah. I remember. But I'm just saying, yeah, yeah. Cam's play, I was like, oh. Oh, yeah. He, but he did, but, but he was doing the majority of his damage from the pocket. Under, yeah. And he, and like, he had the conversation with me. Like, I've been so – and I think one of the problems with being a really gifted athlete is that you rely on being a really gifted athlete. Yeah, right. And eventually, all of us that have played this game, we our, – our skills diminish. Our athletic skills diminish. And then you better understand the game from your neck up. Mm -hmm. And what Cam has done is he has admitted, man, I relied on my athleticism that too many times if the first read's not open, man, I'm going to take off, go make something happen. I'm going to – you know, I'm a ball player, right? And now, last year, he looked at himself and like, I can't survive doing that. I have to be more, more of a student of this game and learn this game from the neck up. I give him a boatload of credit because that is for a great athlete, and he is one of the freaks of freaks when it comes to being athletically gifted. I mean, he walks into a room, and you're like, oh, my Lord, that's a quarterback? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's crazy. But I give him a, a, just a ton of credit for what he's done and the fact that he has matured enough to understand that I've got to do it this way, and, and like I said, tip of the hat to him, Norv Turner, for understanding that and growing as a, a football player, especially from the neck up. I'm telling it like how it is. You guys, don't confuse me. I'm not telling you how I want it to be. No, I got you. <laughs> and how it is, is I'm going to give you a list. Okay, we already know Patrick Holmes is going to do something this year. He's going to respond and probably respond well. Jared Goff, who got who got slept on last year in the conversation is coming back with a loaded roster. So you talk about record and you talk about passing uh, numbers, Russell Wilson. And then you give him DK Metcalf or whatever that's going to look like. It's going to be probably something special. Aaron Rodgers, his redemption, his new situation. You know he's going to put up some numbers. Carson Wentz, I haven't even finished. <laughs> I mean, this is just – that's where Cam is going to get put in terms of – the visual, the optics. And then when you get into the counting numbers, we know he won't qualify just on those alone. And then it's going to be those special moments. And I'm not saying he's going to come short in moments, but he's going to come short when you combine it with the numbers that the others may have moments right. as well. I, I think LeVar makes a great point, though. If you win the South there it with is. those two quarterbacks that have been yes. MVPs, yes. MVP candidates, um, Matt, Matt Ryan was an MVP just a couple of years ago. So if you can win that division and outduel those two guys, I think that would be, regardless of numbers, I think that would be the biggest feather in his cap if he can do that because that division is loaded is. with some I, guys who can play. I, I think he has an ego like a lot of guys in the league, but it's an ego backed up by competitiveness as well. Mm. A lot of guys have egos, but they're not super competitive. Cam, I, I think mm -hmm. in a positive way, is like, Oh, y'all think Patrick Mahomes is what I am. Because I believe, even with the injured shoulders, with the repair, Cam Newton believes and has an argument, I'm the most talented quarterback in this league. Is this LeBron and Steph in football? Like, a little bit. A little no. bit, right? Like, oh, that little cute stuff over there. Okay. Uh, another, I got you. Uh, another personal point to add to it, uh, as Mark made so, so clear and so well stated, I've had a lot of time during my time with Under Armour, spending a lot of time with Cam as well. And one of the things that you start to realize about him is his ability to carry the weight of what he always wanted to be. The things he went through when he was at Florida, how he ended up at Auburn, overcame the odds, ends up playing for a national championship game, wins a national championship game, wins the Heisman. He's all, he's all of these major things. But one thing you realize when you meet that man is – his care 
for, for the younger generations, the things he does with his seven-on-seven seven programs and different things like that. He is constantly out there building that rapport and building that accountability. And a lot of times when you're looking at that, that MVP's position, a lot of it is driven by how the community feels about you as well. You know, it's not just literally coming down to numbers as to why somebody is going to be anointed the guy that, that is the MVP of this league. A lot of times it's the, the story that is attached to and associated with the guy who's getting that award. And Cam has been in this community. There are so many people that are, are relying on him, so many people that, that dream of being who he is based off of direct interaction with this young man. And I think that the way he has conducted himself – and a lot of it for me, I felt it came after the car accident. Now, it could have been some of it had maybe to do with the daughter um, and, and him having a family life. But I felt he was a different person altogether, spiritually and, and, and motivated in a different way after that, that situation took place. Again, I look at Cam and what it is, why he plays the game the, the way that he plays it. And a lot of it is based upon what he represents to the people who are watching him. And those are dangerous people. Mm. When you're watching somebody who's playing for something that's more than themselves, yeah. that's a dangerous person to deal All with. All right, we don't have a lot of time, but I love the comments he made to Ron Rivera that were captured on All or Nothing, expressing a concern about, hey, man, we don't want any distractions. I think it's reflective of what the overwhelming majority of players think in the NFL, do you agree? Oh, yeah, certainly agree. Um, you know, that's a question as a retired player, I got a lot. If you were an active player, would you have knelt? Uh, would you have taken the part in, in, in kneeling before the anthem, during the anthem? And I was like, no. And it puts players, especially black players, in an impossible situation. If you don't kneel, you ain't down for the cause, which is like, wait a minute. One, don't ever question my blackness. And two, don't ever demand that I prove my blackness. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to use any ritual, anything of ceremony, anything that you think is going to try and bring some uh, awareness and association of he's blacker than. And I think that's what Cam was talking about. Just like, look, it's going to ask a question of us that we don't want to answer and frankly shouldn't have to answer. He does a lot, as you said, mm -hmm. in the community, in his world. Why aren't you asking about that? Yeah. Ask me about that. Now you want some <laughs> singular act to define me as a black sure. man. Or what's the consequences? And I think that Cam was trying to speak for all black and white. Don't put us in that position because it's just one moment and it's only one moment of time. I think one of the things in winning championships and one of the reasons it's, it's so hard is you have to have an entire team that is focused on... Um, not individualism, but what can I do to serve the guy next to me? How can I help us make a, be a better team? How can I help us win a championship? How can I sacrifice for you? What can I do for you? And the, the problem is it puts you in an uncomfortable position. Even if you're, even, like, even if you, if you are kneeling, if you're not kneeling, you know what happens every time the locker room gets opened? Somebody needs to come to talk to you about it. Mm. And it gets to the point where you, like, now I got guys hiding in the weight room, hiding in the, you, you've been there, you've been yeah, in the locker room, yeah. we're hiding in the equipment room, we're hiding in the training room, because you just don't want to deal with it. And you know what that does when you're doing that? It, it, you lose connectivity as a team, you, you're hiding over here, you, it separates you, it compartmentalizes you, and all of a sudden we're not focused on winning anymore or sacrificing for one another. We got to answer questions that we don't want to answer. Mm -hmm. And, and that, that's a problem. Yeah, I, I think it, it becomes a distraction. I don't think anyone, whether you fall on one side of it or the other, it, it becomes a distraction. And it is very difficult to win. It's very difficult to win. Now, some may be sitting here watching the show and they're saying, well, it's not about football. It's not about football. It's about, it's about standing up for what, what's right and, and what's wrong. And where I would not disagree with that being a point, a massive point, the reality of it is, is that it's interesting that that situation started with a different franchise. So wherever Kaepernick and, and, and uh, Eric would have went to play, now it becomes their situation as well. So it, it now becomes a, a scenario of where, I think you mentioned it very well, is if, if we don't kneel now that he's here, we're not in support of him. 
and now now you're creating a racial barrier that that could be a racial situation that that is reflective of how you start viewing each other as teammates like mm. i'm feeling a certain type of way because we're having conversations about things that have nothing to do with our job and and in reality in reality there is a time and a place to stand up for the things that you believe in i know people will say you you use the platforms that you have to make a difference you do and and but there's a difference between being a follower and being a leader. And if leadership wasn't involved with them taking a stance, whatever their approach was, to the flag situation, then you ride with that as a team and you figure out what you do. But as a leader, if you're saying, we do not need this in our locker room, as a leader, you're supposed to know what the pulse of your, your locker room is. You're supposed to know if this is going to tear us apart, if this is going to confuse us, distract us, take us down the wrong lane, as a leader, you're supposed to know that. So to me, that was Cam using discernment. That's not him being in the house. That's not him being being a sellout. That's him discerning the situation of for us and at this time, for this team, this is not the right situation for us to be in as a team. And I think that that is commendable as a leader. Whitlock and Wiley, Mark Slareth and LeVar Arrington are back. Time now for a big story. Let's move to Kansas City, where the Chiefs are glad to have Tyree Hill back after the NFL decided not to suspend the receiver over allegations of child abuse. The team could have followed the precedent set by Cowboys several years ago, who made public the list of team rules that Des Bryant was required to follow after he was charged with assault. But Andy Reid declined to get into what exactly the team expects of Tyree Hill. We're comfortable with Tyreek coming back here. Look forward to bringing him back here and having an opportunity to uh, get back doing what, what he loves to do. Um, he has some obligations that he'll, he'll take care of uh, uh, as he goes, and I'm not going to get into all that. We have the t uh, trust in Tyreek and that we're going to go forward in a positive way here. I, I think that's a mistake by the Chiefs. I, I think the Cowboys had, after some situations with Dez Bryant, put it all out there, and I think it wanted help Des Bryant, and I think it offered Des some protection because if, if Tyreek Hill gets in any kind of trouble moving forward, I think this will blow up in the Chiefs' face. Well, you didn't really even take any actions, and what were the stipulations, blah, blah, blah. I, I think there are some people still in the Kansas City Chiefs fan base and just in the NFL fan base would like to believe just for the audio the, the you should be terrified of me too. There should be some sort of punishment. And if that were made public, I think it would take down a little the, a little the animus towards Tyreek Hill. I disagree. Um, I, 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 one, I'm in favor of internal discipline because it's more important that he grows from this situation versus what we know of this situation, which is not going to be fully detailed anyway because a lot of this is protected under police record. Uh, if you look at the Dez example, I don't think that's a great example for this. Uh, what detonated that situation was Dez being arrested and charged with the assault, allegedly, of his mother. That's not Tyreek Hill in this situation, who hasn't been in no situation in terms of arrested, charged with this. So now we're talking about how do you handle it. And if you handle it publicly, as you state, there are only two options, and unfortunately, neither one will service the public. Uh, the court of public opinion, if you give him an excessive penalty that we can all see in line item, we'll say, damn, if he got to do all that and you got to monitor him like that, why is he in the league in the first place? Now, if it's a minimum penalty, a minimum punishment and discipline, Really? Y'all taking this seriously? Come on now, if, you, if the guy did this. You running it, stairs? You're, you're gonna... <laughs> <laughs> I just know how we roll right. as a public, so I think there's no winning. Andy Reid understands that, so it's best to just have internal discipline. I think, and I agree with you, I think what has happened here, you look at the standard that they have set under Andy Reid, like when Kareem Hunt got in trouble, we didn't hear all the details, they just cut him. Yeah. I mean, I didn't, like I heard he lied to the team. You know, that was that. But we didn't hear, uh, we didn't get a line item list of the things he did. He was just gone. Yeah. See you around sometime. Hope it works out for you. They didn't do the same thing with Kareem Hunt. They've kept it internal. And with Tyreek Tyree, Hill. Tyree, or Tyreek Tyree, Hill, Tyree. excuse me. They, they, with Tyreek Hill, yeah. So they've kept it internal. They've kept, they kept the standard the standard for them. This is how we deal with things in, internally. 
and we're not going to vary from that. And it's not your business how we discipline, how we watch, how we help, mm. because ultimately that's the deal. Now, I'm surprised, and this is off topic, but I'm surprised the NFL didn't suspend him based on, you know, the, the player conduct policy. Mm. But, you know, that that's what they chose to do. And we could talk about them spinning the wheel of discipline at Park Avenue and, you know, and how that doesn't make any sense. But I think this is, is par for the course, the way Andy Reid runs his organization. We keep these things internally. They aren't, they, they aren't for the public. It's just not the way we do business. It was a child involved in, in this situation. And one thing that I'll say about Andy Reid, he has always been a player's coach. One thing that's important to know is if, if you do not have all of the details and, and all of the, the factors that play into why he was in trouble and what he was in trouble for, um, then it's very difficult to try to help the public opinion down the, down the direction you want them to, to go because it's just, as he mentioned in his soundbite, it's too much. So what's more important to Andy Reid is knowing that if you are a person that's on the same page as him and he's giving you a fair chance and a fair opportunity with what it is that you're bringing to, to this team, he wants to have the trust. He wants to have the buy-in. And if it's not an egregious situation, it sounds horrible what the charge is. But if you got, get down to the basics of what the, the charge was and it comes back that he really didn't do much of anything and that's why he, the investigation did not yield a punishment, then you have to, in my opinion, you have to look at Andy Reid and you have to commend him for saying, I'm not going to, for the sake of public, public opinion, put you and your personal business out there and say, you know what, we're going to discipline you this way. We're going to do it this way. We're going to do it that way. And you know why? Because the rest of those guys are sitting in that locker room and they're looking at how the leadership is, is handling what takes place when something comes up short. If, if Tyreek Hill does something, again, as you mentioned, to get in trouble, that could lead to the Chiefs organization being looked at in, in a non-glowing way, Shame on Tyreek Hill. Not shame on, on Andy Reid for, for making sure that you're protecting the interest of those players and, and of your team. Shame on Tyreek Hill for violating that, for him being put yeah, in a position right. where he, he, he trust was exercised. This is, this is far more important, this, this topic we're having, this discussion we're having. But think about the way players operate, not in criminal investigations and all those things, but just the way we operate in conjunction with our coaches. A coach can bring me behind closed doors or in front of the team and air me out for not playing well. And I'm man enough to accept it. I'll accept that responsibility, but don't air me out in front of the media. Mm -hmm. That's not their business, right? Mm -hmm. And I think Andy Reid has set a standard saying, hey man, I'm not gonna air out my players and their personal business. We're gonna handle that in-house. We've got our discipline. And I think from a respect standpoint, the guys that play for Andy Reid have so much respect for him as a man and his own family situation, the yeah, problems that he's go. gone through. Yeah, there you like, go. like yeah. he's got empathy, yes, he which does. is more important than sympathy because he's lived through some really tough situations. Whitlock and Wally joined now by NBA champion and NBA agent BJ Armstrong. All right, let's move to the NBA, which just saw one of its craziest off seasons ever with stars changing teams across the league. Among the biggest deals was Anthony Davis's belated move to the Lakers after midseason trade talks broke down and things got ugly between Davis and the Pelicans. But now, one huge NBA voice, Steve Kerr, says the AD situation set a bad precedent for the league. As a former player, I, I always sort of lean towards player empowerment. You know, guys you know, who have earned their uh, right to free agency if they want to make a move and... and you know, make a move for their own careers. I'm, I'm all for it. Uh, they've earned that right. So I'm talking more about the Anthony Davis situation. You mm -hmm. know, where a guy's yeah. perfectly healthy and got a couple years left on his deal and says, uh, "I want to, I want to, I want to leave." I think that's a real problem um, that that the league has to address. That the players have to be careful with. You know, if you come to an agreement with the team that hey, it's probably best time time for us to part ways. That's one thing, but um, you know the Davis stuff was was really kind of groundbreaking, I think, and, and hopefully 
not a trend because it's, it's bad for the league. Question here is simple. Do you agree with Steve Kerr? And I certainly do. I think I, I was reading the ESPN story uh, before we came on air today about the owners are, had their meetings in Las Vegas. Yeah. Very concerned about how can they wrap their arms back around the players and get a little bit more control on the ownership side. Mm, did I just hear you say, how can we control these players a little better? Yeah. Basically, <laughs> okay, I wanted to make sure my paraphrase was accurate. Um, I agree with Steve Kerr, except he fell short in just voicing this towards the players and not towards ownership. The, 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 the contradiction, the hypocrisy comes in when you tell the players, you sign on the dotted line to play for this organization, this team, in this city, and you have years remaining. Where are you going? What are you trying to force? All I say is tell the owners, hey, when you're trading players at 1.35 in the morning and the guy signed on to be here and the guy signed up to be there and he just wants his money and his opportunity and you cut that and undermine that, but then you on the flip side, all of a sudden want the players to stay still with their power, with their rights. We know contracts are conditional. It's okay. It's no unconditional love in sports. We've woke up. We've read it. We've seen it. We've heard the alarm. Doesn't but, ownership have some privileges, Marcella? Oh, you have privileges, but guess what? You don't have total autonomy to do whatever you want without consequence. And the consequence is the player figured out, wait a minute, this league, NBA, is star-driven. NFL is uniform-driven. We get it. So the NBA players are starting to just wake up and use their power. And I say, look, if the owners will stop doing their dirty work, the players... Okay, we don't have to flex power because you're actually respecting us instead of controlling us. Well, the popularity of the game is basically what we're talking about here. You know, being an ex, you know, a former player and an ex-executive and now as an agent, we are all the beneficiaries of the popularity of the game. Meaning, this will happen, this has happened since the beginning of time. Players have been unhappy. Owners, GMs wanted to trade players. That's going to always be there. Now the real problem is, is that it's playing out in the media. We're talking about it. Here we are late into July. We're still talking about the NBA. So mm. th the popularity of the game now and how it's playing out in the public view is what we're really discussing here. And I think that's what Steve Kerr is, is discussing. Now the only issue that I see from a league perspective that we all have to address, which is the following. When a player of Anthony Davis's caliber asks to be traded in the public's view, it's actually devaluing the franchise because they share revenue, it's devaluing the league. So when a player of that caliber asks to move, now we're talking about losing money. This is a business proposition here that we all have to discuss. And I think the players and the owners who are, they have to partner, the players are gonna play, the owners are going to do what the owners do, and they have to figure out and come to a happy medium because if this continues to play itself out in the public view, everyone's going to lose. We're sitting here today on television, and that is the force behind all of the money and the contracts and the players and the owners, what they're making. And if they continue to devalue that because the fans are saying, what's going on there, I think we all stand to lose, and that is the really the million-dollar question that we're going to have to address. Here's my problem. I don't feel holistically, that player rights should hinge on the player's talent level. Because player rights should just be the given right once you're in the league, this is how we respect you and this is how we're going to treat you. When you hinge it on talent level, then all of a sudden what comes into the picture is player empowerment. Oh, we all have different rights? You said, you said it best. When a player of Anthony Davis's caliber, and so Anthony Davis realizes, oh, am I different than the 13th man? I am. So here comes the flex. Now, if you want to level this playing field and treat us respectfully, then it won't get into a power struggle. It won't get into a control element. But when it starts to hinge when on... When the Pelicans mistreat Anthony Davis? No, no. This is how this is... Now, oh, I'm glad you asked this. <laughs> so here's the runway to Anthony Davis' situation. Teams, owners that roll the dice on a guy's contract year. How many times has it happened? Pau Gasol, Dwight Howard. You could talk about Kevin Durant. They roll the dice and they get nothing in return. So then the players actually took a positive sentiment and said, you know what? I'm not happy here. I want you to get something for me because I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. It's inevitable. It may not be this summer. It may be next summer. Whenever my contract's up, I'm out. I'm doing you a favor. You're going to get something for me and you know this. Instead of just trying to sneak you in the dark in the midnight hour like some free agents have. 
And ownership has flipped that to now saying, oh, this guy is a distraction, an issue, doesn't want to honor in his contract, and they start sitting him in the fourth quarter, things of that nature. They actually were trying to do him a favor, get something in return. Got you. I think what ownership is concerned about and what BJ is talking about is, okay, these major markets, Los Angeles, the New Yorks, Miami, they have an advantage mm -hmm. over the teams in yes. the middle. And teams like New Orleans where AD, just, you know what, I ain't going to play for y'all. I'm not going to play in the fourth quarter. I'm gonna, and all of this devalues the Pelicans. And that ownership is upset and, is like, and has a different reality than Steve Ballmer has with the Clippers. Yeah. And there needs to be some balance there. It just can't be this out of control where players who agree, agreed to sign that contract. And I, I guess the, the question is, being an owner, since you have the, the ownership has a bigger investment in this than the players do, mm -hmm. should they not be allowed the privilege of, okay, we can trade you, but you can't opt out of these contracts, basically, <laughs> in, in the way that Anthony Davis uh, just... You got three hats to wear, so you better pick the player. Well, what hat you wear you know, on this <laughs> in dealing with this, the major issue for us, especially at the NBA, we are at a critical, we are at a critical juncture for all of us is because now this is the first time in my dealings with the NBA is that the owners, the general managers, and all these executives are going to have to come up with this solution. How are we going to communicate with this generation? Mm. How are they going to communicate with these kids? Because we can't continue to sign them to two, three, up to five years, and then all of a sudden find out two years later that they're unhappy. Hmm. Where is the communication between the players and these teams that are allowing these su suggested, we're finding out in rumors, you know, our good friend Chris Haynes. How are our Chris Haynes and all these people breaking these stories and these people and these players are in your building and you have no ability to communicate with them? This is the first time now where we're going to have to communicate not only with the best player, but all the other players. Because without that, this league is going to have some trouble and that's what you're seeing. You're starting to see these players now communicate amongst themselves and figure out who they want to play with, where they want to play with, and now the owners and these executives, they're kind of left in the dark. Imagine you two fathers trying to communicate with your children uh -huh. who have $100 million in the bank account. <laughs> Already. <laughs> would, That's a hard communication. Hell yeah. Uh -huh. like, what'd you say, son? <laughs> you got me. You know what? <laughs> I, I, I think there's a deeper conversation to be had, and it's not even with the players. It's with ownership. Listen to this, how the chickens have come home to roost, as they say. Because the jig is up. Let's just be real. You just broke down what's really the crux of the issue. These major markets are dealing with this dynamic differently than the flyover states and, and smaller markets, right? Yes. In that room, they've been saying, hey, level playing field, revenue sharing, we don't have bias. But what's happening is because these players are, are going and electing where they want to go, and it's usually the coast, and, you know, Florida, we get it. Now they can't explain to themselves how we still have a level playing field when in reality we're only upset because the major markets are tilting this out of balance. So until they can talk to their small market teams accurately, honestly, with transparency, that you know what? We don't have a level playing field. This conversation will be blamed on the players because they're just using their power because of their game. Good point. Whitlock and Wiley, LeVar Arrington and B.J. Armstrong. <laughs> <laughs> time to get anti-social. Uh. B.J., I think this is your first time getting anti-social. Yes. Uh. Yes, Buckle your seat. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, yeah, yeah. Darnell Smith, yeah, our I, social media man. Yo, hey, flex on him, though. <laughs> you want me to flex? <laughs> come on, you got to flex that's on him. That, that, that's me and Jim Jack. Yeah, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Me and you, we come out with our own We're going to come up with something. Yeah, we're going to come up with something. We're going to break. Go ahead, Darnell. What's popping? All right, we're going to start with the NFL. Well, like you mentioned, we know Jenna Ramsey ripped almost every QB in the league last year. Mm. Well, this year, he decided to make a grand entrance into training camp, and it looks like he has his mindset on the money. Take a listen. Mm. Y'all know what time it is. This man covered so good, he finna have his own cell phone service. The man so good, they finna give him his own jail. Called Jalen Cowley. Cause these receivers are on 24 hour lockdown. If you check his pocket, he got eight master locks in his pocket. 
They are on lockdown all season. The man, the myth, Jalen Ramsey. <laughs> Shout out to my guy, Ha Ha Davis. I'm sure Tom Coughlin hated this, but oh man, I think it was a good look for Ramsey. Uh, let me be the no. I'm I'm not gonna be the wet blanket. I'm gonna let y'all go first. Okay. Then I'm gonna be the wet blanket. Good, let me be the wet blanket. No, that ain't a good look. Um, oh, I, 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 I will say I loved it, but I, I've learned from all my negotiations to never introduce ego into the negotiation. And when you do something like this. That ownership's ego is like, oh, are you trying to force money out of me? Are you trying mm. to get the court of public opinion against me for mm. your money? And it looks like you got money in that truck already. You already so got enough in the got. pranks. Come Every on, now. What's in them bags? Never <laughs> enough money. Not a good move. Not a good move. <laughs> I tell you what, you know, I thought, you know, he's part of the money team. You know, I didn't know if Mayweather was there. But certainly the entertainment value was funny. Yeah. I don't know how well that's going to play out when it comes time for him to sit down Say it. with you know, management and figure out You're how he's going to You know how it's going to play <laughs> out. It's one of those things. It's funny now, but then you're going, can we get rid of that? Laugh yeah. now, cry later. <laughs> if they show him walking, you see in his face, he was thinking like, I kind of thought it was going to play out a little differently than this, mm. but did I do the right thing? Mm. Listen, the answer is no, because it's a contract negotiation time. If yeah. there was no contract, you'd be fine, right? But right. the reality of it is, if he gets what he's looking for after pulling this, then that organization has to look at him as saying every single time he wants something that he wants, he's going to do what he thinks he needs to do to get it, yeah. and we can't set that example. You know what's funny? Let me just say this. I heard this from comedians. They say a joke is not funny if it's a bullseye. Mm. That means you can't call the real fat person fat. Mm. You got to call kind of like people who were struggling with weight fat. Mm. But if you really fat and you call them fat, ain't nobody laughing at that. You really got a contract coming up. Right. Bro. Don't be joking about that. You That's hit too... that bullseye. You hit that bullseye. Hit that bullseye. It ain't funny, bro. Going uh, out of the water. Right. Moving on to the boxing ring. In the last 24 hours, fans are getting excited about a possible Mayweather-Pacquiao rematch. I think the two started beefing back and forth online. But I wanted to focus on Floyd's IG post here. He had a lot to say about the media attaching his name to Pacquiao and then went on to say, y'all are just upset that I broke Rocky Marciano's record and hate the fact that a black high school dropout outsmarted you all by beating all, all the odds. Ultimately, I will always have the last laugh. Guys, is there any truth to this? I don't know how he got here because I think all the hype is just like, people actually would like to see Floyd and Manny again I don't know if there's any racial animus directed towards Floyd. I I, I don't know how he got that. I, I don't. It's on a small it. scale, but it is. Um, but look, he got five trillion likes and three hundred people saying, "Hey, man, you black," you know, and all that stuff. And he responds to the, the minority. I will say this about Mayweather: there is some envy for him in that sport oh, of course because there is. he he gets hit less and he gets paid more, and everybody does, they hate that equation. But that's that's. But a lot of the envy is from black boxers. You ever talk to black boxers Thank you. like? Man, he ducked everybody. And he got more <laughs> money than all the boxers yeah. that's talking about I ain't about mad him. at Mayweather. I love him. Smart. You got, I, I just, I'll say this. I'll say this. It's more nationalism than it is racism, if you ask me. Mm. I think he's being, he's, he's misconstruing what he's feeling. Racism is always there, right? What he's talking about, that's always there. But we were at the fight. Boxing, it may be the only sport that I've ever been a part of in a, in a live spectacle where you can have straight lines drawn in the sand, no cut cards, no chaser, no nothing. Yeah. Pacquiao, pride of the Philippines. Are you a Filipino? Yes! <laughs> <laughs> Canelo, are you from Mexico? Yes! <laughs> what about what, what about uh what about Floyd? No! Right, right, right. It's the only, it's yeah. the only sport soccer. I've ever they do seen. It in soccer. Uh, well, okay. I've never been to a soccer, big soccer. soccer. Yeah, there yeah, you go. Right. Well, you know, money is he's genius. He's really great at kind of like promoting himself. And what he's doing is he's drawing a line. We have the good guy, Manny, and then there's Boy, Mayweather, man. and he's promoting himself, getting up fight. interest, and you know what? I give him fight. credit. He is always figuring out how to build interest in his fights, and he knows what that would be for him on this payday if they go. This is probably a clue Bam. that we're going to see the That's fight. Yep. It's <laughs> the biggest fight uh, of the decade. Either love easily. me or love to hate me. Either yeah. way, pay for it. Pay me. Absolutely. <laughs> All right, let's go to the question of the day. Darnell, yeah. take it away. Yeah. 
All right, guys, so a story started trending online uh, this week that after earning $100 million throughout his career, Adrian Peterson is deep into debt after what his lawyer says is yet another situation of an athlete trusting the wrong people. Um, I want to ask you guys, why does this seem to happen so often with athletes? Wow. You want, you want yeah, me to jump ahead. on it? Yeah. Yeah. Go I, I, I just did a letter in the Players' Tribune about a letter to my younger self. A lot of times, athletes are, are tagged and deemed as being stupid, irresponsible with their money. A lot of, a lot of adjectives to explain them. It really is a lack of experience. And that's, that's what I think. I think guys are smart. They, they make decisions. But I'll give you, a great, I'll give you a great story. The Tisch family and the Mirror family, they own the, the New York Giants, one of the most successful uh, franchises in all of sports. Their grandchildren are locker player porters. They make sure that your spikes are organized, your helmet is on where it's supposed to be. Everything is in its proper place. They take care of it. You pay them to do it. They are teaching those young men for the next 15, 20 years how it is you're supposed to run an organization from the bottom up, not the top down, from the bottom up. I think the problem that we run into as athletes is that we are not – experienced enough to be jumping into these investments that we're jumping into. My name is this. I'm famous. I'm popular. It's going to work. No. Put your money in. Your best investment, your best stock is you when you're in the league. That's the best stock. If you need a return on making 13, 14 million, 15 million a year, then you're in the wrong business. Mm. You're in the wrong business. Take the time to let your investment, you playing the game, be your investment. When you're done playing the game, when you're done, then get the experience. Invest instead of five five million dollars in that real estate uh, deal that they say all these other guys are in it. Mm. Go invest five hundred thousand, two hundred fifty, and get the education to learn purely and solely how it works. Where do I go? Who do I align with? What is the what is the process and protocol of this? The biggest issue is we take 15, 16, 18 years to make money playing the game we love, and we learn it all the way up and through. And once we go pro, we think that that process stops. And I think that that's the biggest misconception is it's not dumb. It's just inexperienced. Look, there is a responsibility to the players. There's a responsibility to those they trust and the due diligence. Uh, that's not my, my, my primary concerns. Two things I want players to understand and I want the public to know. One, players. You make very immature decisions. I was guilty. I'm talking about the cars, mm -hmm. houses. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about the investments, mm -hmm. plural. And then you talk about then some of the other stuff that comes from it, the kids, mm -hmm. divorce, mm -hmm. a lot of you guys. Mm -hmm. uh, and then for the public's consumption, understand that the average millionaire in the United States is 57 years old. Mm. You know how much life you've lived to understand the value of a dollar? And then it's not 20, it's not 25, it's not 30. For a reason, you have to learn to climb up that mountain. Mm -hmm. But when you get helicopter there and you get an inordinate amount of money, you think you did the climbing. And you make decisions like someone who really didn't have that experience. Indeed. It's unfortunate. It's gas meeting fire in your 20s with that much money. And working with these young kids, the one thing that I always try to stress to them, which is really, really difficult and we all have to learn as former athletes is the word no uh -huh. no is the word. no it, 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 this is going to go sideways until you actually learn and have the discipline to say no mm -hmm. and I encourage every player to understand what that word and the power of that word so no is a something that we all have to come to grips painful with painful word it's a painful word you got to say no to your family to you got to say no to your friends you got to say no to all of these things mm -hmm. and until you understand the power of that word you're going to continue to hear stories like this and it's it's a sad story but it's a true story and and we all have to go through it and hopefully you'll learn that lesson sooner rather than later I, I don't have time to unpack this fully but i've been trying to explain to people the the number one business decision a man or a woman is going to make is who they partner with in a marriage. Mm. That's a business decision that will set the foundation for every other business decision you make the rest of your life. Adrian Peterson ha has six kids, I think six baby mamas. You know how expensive that is? Hmm. You know how many bad business decisions that is? And so when he talks, people you didn't trust, I, I, mm. you got six baby mamas, according to what I read this morning.
that's expensive as hell. He's supposed to be broke. I don't care how much money you make. Mm -hmm. You're supposed to be broke if, if you've been that irresponsible in the primary business decision that you make, who you partner with. DJ Armstrong is back with us. Let's move to the Clippers, who welcome Kawhi Leonard and Paul George to the family with an introductory press conference this afternoon. Kawhi was as excited as Kawhi can get, and team president Lawrence Frank appeared to take a, draw, a jab at the LeBron James-led Lakers. Take a listen. We got something special. We can make history here. And, um, you know, we got the right team to do it with Steve, with Lawrence, and Doc, championship head coach. And I'm excited, um, you know, watching that video um, that they just presented. I'm ready to go. Our players and coaches deserve a ton of credit today. It was the culture that they created that made Kawhi and Paul want to join our group. And I think the things that, in terms of talking to Kawhi and talking to Paul, it's the toughness, the hard play, the drama-free in the premier market in the National Basketball Association. The drama free, that to me sounds like a direct shot at LeBron James and the Los Angeles Lakers and Magic Johnson. Mm. Do you think that the drama, the circus or with the Lakers is the reason Kawhi chose the Clippers? Yes, I actually do. And, and not for the reasons that may be funny and some jokes pointed at him, but for serious business reasons. Because people understand what drama is and you can label it as a genre and the description but what it really is is like a response and emotion that comes from unexpected sets of circumstances and that doesn't sound like stability so you drama it sounds great until you're like oh I'm living through drama that means I don't know tomorrow because it's going to come with its own bag of surprises here's Kawhi he's like hmm your lead recruiter who's Magic Johnson has quit your organization not once, but twice. People forget, go back to 2007 when he was minority owner. Ah, I got to get out of this. I don't know how this is going to play out. And then you look around and you say, what do you have? But I'm from L.A. and I know Kawhi from L.A. PG. We always learned from growing up in these streets. It ain't just what you got, but how'd you get it? Because I saw a lot of people flossing, but how you get that? Oh, you got it that? Nah, I'm good. And I think he's looking at the Lakers like, oh, y'all got... Y'all got LeBron. That's cool. He was supposed to come with another star. He didn't. Oh, AD forced his way here. How y'all get him? Uh, I don't want to be involved with that drama. So I think Kawhi and PG just want to go handle business, handle basketball without all the extras that come with, obviously, being a Laker. Well, I'm really excited because now we have a real rivalry. I yeah. Mean, we have a Clippers-Laker rivalry that's going to be packed here in the city of Los Angeles, and I'm really excited about that. I think the undertone of... Kawhi, really why he came there is because of the leadership of Doc Rivers. I think Doc fits his personality. Mm. I think Doc fits his game. This is a defensive, you know, minded player first and foremost. And Doc Rivers, you know, I played against Doc. Doc was a defensive player. He was a, a you know, he was really a tough player who just got after it defensively. So I think the personality of Kawhi really fit who Doc Rivers is as a coach. And I think it's a great fit for him. I'm looking forward to the rivalry. I mean, you have the, the glitz, you have the, the power of the Lakers, and this blue-collar Clippers team is going to get after it, and I really like what they're doing. I, I think what we have is a Clippers organization, man, that's justifiably feeling itself and wants a fight. And, and literally, I think the comments uh, from Lawrence Frank, I, I, I think... Uh, we, we don't have it. We didn't show it. But Kawhi said, hey, I think over the past few years, the Clippers have been a better organization and a better team here. Mm. Uh, I, I, he, it seemed to indicate there will be no load management next year. That mm. he's planning on going. <laughs> he wants to go to war. And that's what I, I think this is awesome. For the NBA, there's some real tension in here because whether LeBron wanted a fight or not, He's got one, and LeBron's going to respond. Yeah. LeBron's no punk. He's not <laughs> right, going to go right. out quietly. <laughs> He's going to respond. This will oh, be yeah. terrific. But I do think, I agree with all of you all, that w when Kawhi and, and Uncle Dennis sat down and just look, okay, hold on. I got Jerry West. I got Lawrence Frank. I got the richest man in sports, mm. and I got Doc Rivers. So, right. Championship. And I look over here, and I go, Frank Vogel? Magic just quit? Jeannie Buss is, you know, 
Vince, Rob Palinka, and everywhere, just quite frankly, and again, LeBron's no punk, LeBron's no, everywhere LeBron goes, there's always drama. Yeah. And and it's an easy choice. Yeah. It's it's a real I think he would have been silly to go to the Lakers with this option right here on the table. The only reason why you go is the brand. Yeah. Uh, like the torch. Isn't that what you say? Rather than just... Dude, you, dude <laughs> I'm telling you, man, This is remind, that's why I really love the Clippers. Sometimes I wish I could take that away so people could understand the words that are coming out of my mouth, that you want to go somewhere and light the torch, not just carry the torch. And I had options coming out of high school, and this is a, a little parallel of this. But I remember all the big schools coming up to me, and then this l lowly old football program named Columbia kept telling me, come here, man. You can light the torch. You can do something different and have impact. You go to the Lakers, respect, brand. We know history. That's going to be number 17 if he wins there. You come to the Clippers, one, one, <laughs> one. Does that not resonate with today's athletes and players? Of course. Yeah, I mean, he's taking this responsibility, and that's what you have to love. He's taking on the responsibility and holding himself accountable. If they are, if they were to win it here in, Al in Los Angeles with the Clippers, mm. it would be something special, something we haven't seen before. Yeah. But I tell you what, I'm loving the tension that they have. I'm loving now that they're, these, both of these teams are going to be in the upper echelon of the Western Conference, and I think it's going to be good, good for the, you know, good for the sport. Look at the dynamic mm. between the Lakers and the Clippers that starts really at the very top. At the beginning of this press conference today, Steve Ballmer was out there front and center doing Steve Ballmer things. <laughs> He's the ultimate male cheerleader. Yes. He's out in oh, front, man. his passion. Jeannie Buss yes. doesn't even show for press conferences, right. doesn't talk. Yeah. She got slaughtered by magic. Her and Polinka has never said a word. Mm. This, again, when you just look at the confidence and the attitude of the two organizations, mm. Ballmer out there like that, get up! Mm. <laughs> <laughs> It's a whole different energy, man. The, the Clippers are poised to do something incredible. Whitlock and Wiley, LeVar Arrington is back with us. Let's move to Odell Beckham Jr., who is fresh off a new GQ profile that he mostly used to whine about his critics, including those who say he's got too many distractions. Well, he's decided to follow up with that by launching his new YouTube channel, which he says will show you the real Odell Beckham Jr., <sighs> he got a lot of smoke, and he just keeps fanning the flames. Mm. I, I just, a YouTube, he needs a YouTube, I guess he's off Broadway, so he's going to YouTube. Yeah. I see it being a distraction. I don't see it being a distraction. I just see it being his life and content that he's not wasting and not getting paid for anymore. It, it, one, YouTube has a monetary system in place where mm -hmm. per subscriber, Per view, you get paid. You know, maybe pennies on a dollar to an Odell Beckham, but it adds up. Weren't we just talking about Adrian Peterson and his money issue? Like, <laughs> Odell making it. sure it ain't gonna be him, right? Talk about it. One, for real. But two, uh, this is commonplace for especially the star, superstar people who you give it to Instagram, they ain't give you anything back. YouTube will actually give you something back and allow you to bring in sponsorship and other things. So there's a Ronaldo, Mayweather, Conor McGregor, Steph Curry, KD, et cetera. All those guys have YouTube channels. And I will say this, none of them have enough subscribers except Conor McGregor. Not even Conor McGregor, let me excuse me. None of them have enough subscribers based on their cachet and their Q rating, how popular they really are. Because mm. athletes are late to YouTube. There's a girl in my gym, she has 10 million subscribers. Odell is gonna start off, Juju has 786,000. Point, point being, she's making bricks, and she's just working out at the gym. Mm -hmm. And you got these guys I late to see her. Yeah, she bad. <laughs> but, Ten million. That's so. Funny. You got to get your game up, and I'm glad he's getting hip to it. Well, I'll, I'll put it to you like this. I like it. I think it's brilliant because he is doing something that has needed to happen for quite some time in the sport of football, which is giving a narrative to the player. And the more we learn about players' personalities outside of all of the polarizing things that can be viewed as negative, um, there is nothing wrong with Odell Beckham. 
You know, we could call him drama, this, that, and the other. You could say what you want to say. Odell Beckham doesn't do anything wrong by the standards of doing something wrong. He, he is a professional. He works hard just like anybody else to be the best that he can be. He maximizes on, on his branding. He's a part of pop culture. He's everything that a football player should want to be. And I don't think that there's anything wrong with him leveraging his brand the way that he is because I, you are more than a football player. I think that some people have different personalities. Clearly, I do mm. in terms of I got 90 minutes here where I'm on stage. I don't want to be on stage no more than that. Boy, say <laughs> it when you go home. I, I don't want to be on stage nobody. no more <laughs> right. than these 90 minutes. Right. Other people want to be on stage all the time. And mm. just a stage is a place for a performance. It's not reality. And so that's great. He's going to put on a performance on his YouTube, and he'll make money. And maybe he's just more of a performer than I am. But he's going to Cleveland. He's going to Cleveland. He doesn't have the spotlight. He doesn't have the shine and the glitz and the glam of being in the big city anymore. Create a, create a channel where you can try to keep that, that focal point on what you're doing. Like, if I'm a player, that is sensational branding skills, if you ask me, because you're not in the Big Apple anymore. I don't think it's that. You're I not think, in the Big Apple. I think what's getting lost here is, one, you're not performing if you do workout A and not film it and put it on YouTube and then do the same workout tomorrow and actually put it on YouTube. That's part of what he's just going to do. I'm already doing it. Oh, let me go put it on this. But beyond that, I think I have to push back. When you get into, as an athlete, branding and messaging online in this way, fans don't consume us that way. You're an athlete. Stay in that athlete. As soon as you step out, not saying it's wrong, they will always have dissension and pushback. So if you're doing it just to clear up the branding and messaging on you, I think that's going to be futile because you are, Floyd just showed us in the last post. They're always going to be those. But who Floyd well. always leverages Gotta it. Gotta go. on that. Uncle Jimmy's here. Most definitely. Uh, I have no idea what you're wearing, but mm, uh, yeah, I wouldn't expect you to. You, you ain't of this caliber like me and Cam. <laughs> You ain't oh, on this level. Oh, that's from the Cam Collection? I like yeah, yeah. that. Well, well let, let me put it like this. Cam Collection. Just based off of the big dummy of the day, yeah. and somebody said that six babies' mamas, having six baby by six baby mamas is a problem? Yeah. But six baby mamas is six options, you doggone <laughs> dummy, you. What's the matter for you? You don't know what you, you ain't got no kids, do you? Oh, oh no. man. All right, then you don't know what the hell you talking about. Oh, man. All right, here's hey. a highlight. Yeah. Six times. From mm. our discussion <laughs> earlier about well, Cam Newton. Contract issues too, though. Yeah. <laughs> Once again, I'm starting this season betting on Cam being in the MVP race. His competitive nature is causing him to mature as a player and a leader. Andrew Luck had a great year, was the comeback player of the year, and was not in the MVP conversation. I think Cam Newton will find himself somewhere in that world. All right, Uncle Jimmy. I think Cam's going to be in the MVP race this year. Mm. I'm high on Cam. Oh. Marcellus disagrees. Your thoughts? I hope. This, is, this, this, this situation here is a little convoluted. Mm. It's, it's, it's a little complex in a few various ways. <laughs> because the question is, can Cam return to form? Mm. Yes. The next question is, will he return to form? No. <laughs> <laughs> what? Because no. he's too young and he's too foolish. <laughs> to understand the value of protecting your body. Mm. You understand what I'm saying? I'm Look here, let, let me break something down for you, young fellas. L listen to me now. This is what I don't like about young people. We can always ask y'all something, but we can't never tell y'all nothing. Ooh. <laughs> so listen up to what I'm going to say here. The human mind, the human mind is devised on the premises <laughs> that... <laughs> go, the go the ahead, human man. mind is devised on the premise that when created with a situation or a circumstance, you either choose, you got one or two options. You can either choose to fight or you can choose flight. Uh -huh. Cam Newton chooses flight and runs. Mm. Whenever a problem hits him, he gets in that pocket, he take off and run. Why? Because he bigger than everybody and he take off running. But one thing, he ain't faster than everybody, is he? No. That ain't too smart. Tom Brady, he know he ain't faster than everybody. But when that time comes, what does Tom do? Tom stay there and fight. Boom, throw a little dink pass. Boom, throw the pass away. He lives to fight another day. Okay. Thus creating longevity. Mm, huh? Okay, you got <laughs> that back. <laughs> now, hold up. Now, peep me out on this here now, because uh -huh. I don't want y'all to see, I don't want y'all to think I'm on no arrogant mess. Because the Bible says ain't no fool like an old fool. <laughs> and I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to come to the confessional and tell y'all that this weekend, 
Uncle Jimmy was kind of acting like an old fool out here. Uh-oh. <laughs> out here at Dre's. Oh, okay. Uh oh, you uh -oh. Still uh -oh. You know, I, I, I put myself in a position here at Dre's fooling yeah. around with these blue M&Ms. Uh, I looked up, I was in fight or flight. <laughs> that's I had to, hey, hey, listen to me, Marcus. Listen to hey, me. That's now. six, AP. Hey, man. AD. I felt like an NFL player. What? I realized I couldn't take them hits like I used to. <laughs> Especially them big ones. <laughs> <laughs> Look at man, I, I should have stayed in the pocket. <laughs> but now I got to run around out there with them blue M&Ms, man, you know. Melting. <laughs> no, man, I, I Jimmy hurt himself. Man. Yeah, I'm, I ain't gonna lie, man. I'll be honest with y'all laughing a little bit. I hurt myself, but I'm y'all don't even know it because I didn't say nothing to y'all. I'm under doctor's care right now. Mm. You know, I what don't happened? say nothing. Yeah, to you we running out of time. What happened? You got I time? told my whole tater cup, man. <laughs> Yo, what? Yo, what? <laughs> I told my whole tater cup. <laughs> what is that? It's a muscle, it's a muscle in the <laughs> groinal region, man. <laughs> I can't go into details like that now. Look, man, let's just say that I ain't young like I used to be. <laughs> I ain't got the strength that I used to have. That I had to learn the hard way. Man. So you can't. Well, if I ever eat another blue M&M again, it'll be too damn soon. <laughs> she know with that yellow peanut right there. <laughs> hey, we got to get to our approval rating. Everybody got five. jokes. We got <laughs> you got to work that I out. I got huh? Cam at a 75. And I got pink eye. <laughs> I got Cam at a 75. 19 job forms. Love the way he's handled the offseason. Yes, yes. 18 all-time greatest. Me. Yeah. Knocked him up in character for the way he handled the Eric Reed situation. Mm. Up to an 18. 20 authenticity. 75 total. Yeah, man. I got love for Cam Newton. Following him on his YouTube channel <laughs> already. Oh. IG as well. Uh, respect to Cam Newton. We, we landed at the same spot. He's an all-star, but we know he's going to ball out this year. Go get it, Cam. All right, that's it for us. We'll be back tomorrow. You look good. Jimmy to the doctor. What's wrong with your cuff? <laughs> it's my whole tater cuff. <laughs>